Hello, everybody. My name is Jason Ingber, and I'm going to be hosting this conversation with Keith. Keith is a legend trial attorney. He's done a series of podcasts. He has a book. You better check it out and buy it, Deeper Cuts. Keith has done more trials than I've ever heard anybody do. He has a career in the courtroom, and he's got beautiful wisdom to share with us. And today, we're going to hear some life and law lessons from Keith. Keith, what are we going to talk about today? And then let's jump right in. All right. This is one that um, excites me because it's got such um, importance in, in my mind, such importance, not just to lawyers, not just to advocacy, but to how we get along with one, one another and kind of mending fences and understanding each other better. I learned it in the courtroom. I designed it for the courtroom. And then I learned, you know what, you just designed something that's helping you in life. And I'd like to share it. So with that, let me get into it. And what it really has to do with is, is um, if you're in a situation where you have someone who has a different point of view than you and you want to persuade them, you want them to convince them to see it your way, um, at the very least, you want them to hear you in a really re uh, and understand where you're coming from, at least, and maybe you change their mind. That's the ultimate goal. But they're coming at it from a completely different perspective. And so y'all are, are at odds on this issue, whether it be as a lawyer, you, it happens in mediations, and we call them mediations at settlement conference. Whether it happens in courtrooms, it's a big clash. Sometimes you have jurors that you feel some distance from and you want to bridge the gap. And in life, we always have it, whether it's with loved ones or friends or family, we all have differences. And God knows our country's got differences now. So, so let me talk to you about it. And it's really just, there's some fundamental realities. And from a lifetime in courtrooms in this adversarial setting where by nature you've got opposing views. And one side's going to come out ahead of the other. You've had, I've had to hone this skill and figure this out to survive and thrive. And so this is the end product of, of a lot of thinking about it and a lot of living it. If you really want to get someone to listen to you and give you a chance of getting through to them when they're in an opposite conclusion you want them to be in, the starting point is not to browbeat them. It's not to butt heads with them. Because what happens when you say, put up your dukes, you're wrong. They put up their dukes. What the hell chance do you have of change in anyone's mind when you pick a fight with them? The starting point isn't the fighting. The starting point is putting the fighting away and say, I need to walk in your shoes. I need to see it through your eyes, even if I disagree. Because if I understand how you got where you got and why you're there, then I can figure out how to talk to you about maybe my ways worth thinking about. Yeah, but Keith, how do you do that if you think the other side is just being a baby and unreasonable and they're just being completely, they can't, you can't even talk to them. They don't want to be in the same room as you. Like they're not going to talk to you unless they have that specific point of business. If you pick up the phone, they're not going to pick up the phone. They, you know, they, they just really, they wish you would drop dead. You know, how do you, how do you, how do you balance that? How do you, how do you get to wedge all these things in when that's the dynamic you're dealing with? Sure. I'm going to give you the ideal answer, and then I'm going to confess the real answer with me. The more stubborn they are, the more pig-headed they are, the more of a jackass they're being, the more important this is if you really want to get through it. And it, the harder it is, because the more you don't want to do it. Now, there's a line I cross where I, my strategy changes to go to hell, I'll see you in court. So I got enough of my dad in me that I have my limits. I ain't Gandhi. Um, but when I blow my stack, you know what I do? I feel good for about three minutes, and then I feel like hell because I realize, well, any chance of working, getting the end result I wanted without having to go to the jury just went out the damn window because of your temper, bud. So it isn't the way to go, but I, I, I don't want to stand up here and sound like I got this all figured out. I figured out how to do it. It's easier said than done sometimes, depending on how offensive the other side is. But the truth is, if you can stay true to this, you may not get through to that person, but your only hope is this method. 
And look, there's some people you say, I don't give a damn if you see it my way. Save it. Don't do this. But when it's someone you, you care about or need them to see it your way, then this is more important than, you know, standing up for your rights to say, I ain't listening. You're, you're being a jackass. I can be a bigger jackass. So let's talk about it. There are really three steps. I always like steps, steps, steps. The reason I like them because they're processes. And processes can be repeated rather than just someone talking about a concept that's hard to put in a box. I like to put it somewhere it can be handed off and reused. So here are the, the three basic steps to this. And it is, number one, you got to start out by removing the whole topic of right or wrong. Temporarily. Because, look, if we don't care about right or wrong, then we're lost. As a lawyer, if you don't care about right or wrong, you're in the wrong profession. So I'm not telling you right or wrong doesn't matter. It's everything. This is just a temporary pause you're putting on it to work a process to try and accomplish a meaningful, righteous goal. So first and foremost, remove the right and wrong temporarily from the process, from your thought process. And forget the point you're trying to make for a moment. Forget the point you want to make and forget who's right and wrong. It is freeing and it's an essential step to get to the next step. Because otherwise, everything you're doing, your mind's just saying, they're wrong, they're wrong, they're wrong. Damn it, they're pig-headed. They're... This won't work if you're thinking that way. It frees you the minute you say, for a moment, I don't care who's right or wrong. For a moment, I'm going to quit trying to make a point. So what am I going to replace now that I've created this vacuum, this space for me to have an opportunity to make headway? It's the second step. You have to force yourself to see it their way. Suspend all judgments. It, it doesn't matter right or wrong. Give yourself the freedom to think about, I really want to see it their way. I want to walk in their shoes. I want to feel their skin. I want to look at it through their eyes, not only what they've saying. I heard them saying it. I want to understand why they're saying it. What's going on that's making them say that? That's what I mean by stepping into their shoes, really stepping. Their, but you know what you can't do is step in their shoes going, they're just wrong, the son of a bitches. It, it, it shuts down your, your imagination. So you, A, remove right and wrong and forget the point you're trying to make for the time being. So that you can go to step two, which is to force yourself to see it their way. Why? And pretend, you know what? I get what they're saying. I understand why they think they're right. And you're free to do it in this space in your own mind because you put all these other things that would prevent you and block you from doing that. And then the third step is, from their perspective, not yours, you still haven't returned to right and wrong in your point of view. You're still in their shoes. Ask yourself, from their perspective, what would get to me? Now that I'm in their shoes, I'm in their, I see it their way. I'm actually getting it. What would, what would get to me? What might change my mind? What would make sense to me? What is the one or two or three things that someone on the other side could say to me that I'd go, hmm, he does have a point. Elephant in the room, have you ever actually moved an inch off of your position after doing this process? Either personally or professionally? Absolutely. Can you give us a story that would make that concrete? Yeah, yeah, I have. Yeah, I have been in a position where I was in, was, was in an argument with another lawyer and it got heated. And, and I'm really, I, I want him to put on my gravestone. Mitnick is a genuinely nice guy, because I am. But don't fuck with him. Because if you really go wrong with me, I, it, it's gonna get ugly. But I, I hate going there. I really like, I love people. And my enemy, I, I love when I have a lawyer on the other side who's a class person who I like um, rather than someone I want to kill. And you know what? You're better with a lawyer like that because you're not spending all your energy every night talking about someone, let me tell you what they did. You're actually thinking about what you ought to be thinking about. But I had a lawyer that really 
had said something to me and really set me off. And I cursed him out. And I went home. And I start, as I always do, I'm the first to jump someone when they're bad. And I'm the first to apologize after I have because I'd feel bad I jumped them. And I did. And I came, I, I, got, I didn't want to just say sorry I blew my stack because that comes off insincere because I wouldn't mean it. So I thought, all right, what the hell is this? Why did he say that? And I went through the process in my mind. Why did he say that? Where is he coming from? And I honestly couldn't get there. I just thought, I don't know, he's just a jackass. So I came in the next morning, and I saw him in the hallway, and I pulled him aside. Listen, I said, I'm sorry we had that yesterday with argument. I said, but I'm trying to understand why you said what you said so we truly can put this behind him. And I, and I told myself, listen, don't get defensive. And about half what he said was bullshit. But there was a kernel in there. I went, all right. That isn't what I said. It's not what I meant. But if that's the, I could tell he really perceived it that way. And I thought, if that's the way he perceived it, I'd have been, the, I would have been fired off like he fired at me to start it. And I realized, okay, he's wrong about that. That's not, he's twisted what I said, that something unrecognizable. But that really is his experience. So that's why he said something crappy to me. And so you know what I said? I didn't say, that's not what I meant. That's not what I said. Man, you're full of shit. We'd have just ended up cursing each other out again. I thought it doesn't matter. I really want to make peace. We got enough days more of trial, and he's up to that point seemed like a pretty good guy. And I said, look, man, now that I hear you say that, honestly, I didn't mean to communicate it, but I see what how you felt. And, and if I was you, I'd have been angry too. So I thought you started it. You thought I started it. I'm sorry, for what and I, you don't say, I'm sorry that you thought I did it because you know what that is. You're an idiot. I said I'm sorry I said it. I should have been more thoughtful about what I was saying. I didn't intend it, but if I'd have thought about it, I'd have realized that could come out that way. And I'm sorry. I didn't mean to insult you. I love this. I think that your gravestone is going to be a lot more generous than the uh, thing that you were saying earlier. And the implementation of your process, removing right from wrong just thinking about it and then seeing what could be something that would move like me off my position and then you implementing it. Uh, that's a really beautiful thing. I, I, and then some high level mirroring almost at the end there. Yeah. yeah. And I'm going to, I want to walk through this in a couple courtroom examples and, and maybe some life examples, but you just said something mirroring. And I, and, and because, you know, I talk so many times to just lawyers and in this format, I understand there's going to, there may very well be, be some folks that aren't lawyers. And I do I'm actually going to send this particular episode to my mother. So, yes. <laughs> okay. I want to share something about, I went to, I'm divorced, remarried. I've been coming up on 16 years, very, very happily married. My last marriage was not. Congrats. Incredible. That's amazing. Oh, yeah. But my last one was, did not end happy. And I won't throw stones. It just, look, it, we were, didn't, didn't work. Um, regardless whose fault it was. But I went to counseling and I learned a valuable lesson that really is part, you know, life experiences come together for our epiphanies and our ideas and things that move us. And this was one of them. And I went to counseling and they had something that counselor said, who was really actually very talented and said, we're going to do mirroring. That's what made me think of it. You said mirroring. And I thought, you know, what the hell's mirroring? And she goes, here's how it works. And all it was, it's a fancy word and technique for active listening. And in life, active listening is a skill set that we forget about that's essential. When someone is really being listened to actively, they feel respected. It is a bonding. In courtrooms, active listening is a must. Because if you're worried about how you're performing and how you're looking and you're worried about your next question and you're not listening, for example, in a cross-examination, they may say something was the greatest answer you could wish for, and you missed it because you weren't actively listening. Or you may think they gave you the answer you needed, and they really didn't. They skirted it, and you missed it because you weren't really listening. You worried about your next question. And if you're actively listening hard, you're going to understand the fatal flaws in what they're saying when you're right and they're wrong and give you opportunities to then 
expose it to the world. So active listening in a courtroom is everything, but in personal life, how many times is someone listening and you're looking down at your emails, your text? How many times is someone doing it and you're kind of looking off and someone's walking by? What You know when they do it to you, what do you think? <laughs> you ain't listening to me. And people just keep talking because we it's become so commonplace. But it's rude. <laughs> it's just rude. And if, some, if you're talking to someone they're doing, and really listening, you know what you do? You go away saying, I like that person. <laughs> Don't you want people to like you? Listen to them, they'll like you. And by the way, you may figure something out that's helpful. So anyhow, the, I, I'm off the law lesson, but this is, let me if, just bear with me a minute on this mirroring because it, it was profound to me. So what you did was active listening, and it worked this way. Your spouse, significant other, was to talk about something that was a big stressor. And your job was to be completely 100% unjudgmental. You couldn't be defensive. No matter how wrong they were, they could be 100% wrong. You weren't allowed to say, but that's wrong. That's not what happened. You couldn't fix anything. You just had to listen. And the idea was then listen, and to prove you were listening, you had to say it back. And if you were off the mark, they would say, they weren't supposed to say, no, you idiot, that's not what I said. They're supposed to be kind back and say, close, but you missed part of it. And you're supposed to then say, tell me some more, explain some more. And you do this process of listening, repeating back what they're communicating, not verbatim, that's parroting. You say it back in your own words to prove you got it until they go, you got it. The magic of doing that process is even if they're wrong, even if they're saying you did this and this, and you go, I didn't do that. That's bullshit. You now understand at a deep level appreciation how they experienced it. And when you understand how they experienced it, your temperature comes down. And it becomes far less important to prove that's not what I said. Now you feel bad. You feel, I didn't mean to, but I made you feel like shit. And I'm sorry. And I'm going to work on that. And it is healing as hell. Amazing. That's weird. Amazing. Now, in, in my situation, I would do it really good because I wanted to impress the counselor. Look how well he plays this. And she goes, very good. And then it would be my turn. i say, well, here's what's bothering me. You're wrong. Rah, rah, rah. <laughs> so and then, and then, I'm divorced. Didn't work. But I took the process with me. And it's a, it's a beautiful thing in life. And I use it in courtroom. So let's let's go yeah, on. Yeah, and with you're it. married now, sixteen years. I think you've. Uh, they, I think you're living everything you're you're talking about. I, and my wife is the love of my life, and I am hers. That's beautiful. Apart from some of these lessons, we 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 all learn as we get older, hopefully. Um, in any event, um, so let's go back real quick to the three steps, and I'm gonna apply them in the courtroom just a little bit for the lawyers that are listening. A couple examples, um, but. First, remove right or wrong from the process altogether and forget the point you're trying to make for the moment. Two, force yourself to see it their way. Really see it. Understand it. Why they feel that way with no judgment. And third, then staying in their perspective, in their point of view, ask yourself what might matter to them, what may get to them, what might take, change their mind or at least take the wind out of their sails where they're not so passionately against you in a courtroom. That's valuable too with jurors and it's not a one person decision. So um, let me apply that to a mediation setting. And for those of you that are not lawyers, mediation is a fancy word we use for settlement conferences. When we go, usually the court orders them, but regardless, both sides come and there's a mediator who tries to broker a deal between the two sides. One side's up here wanting this, one side's down here, doesn't want to pay much, and they try to move them until you find a common ground and everybody settles. That's called a mediation. And it's a common, very, okay, very I, common. I, I have to go on a tangent. Sorry, sure. not sorry here, but I just need to ask. You have the wealth of experience. Have you ever just like walked out of a mediation early? Oh, hell yes. Um, I I've walked hear. out of many. That's, but I mean, I, we walk out of mediations all the time early when it's clear that we're so far. Look, you're here and they're here. You can bridge the gap. If you're here, you ain't bridging the gap. Every now and then it actually happens. 
But when they come in saying, look, there's a cold day in hell, we're going to ever pay you more than $10,000. And you're saying, well, this is a cold day in hell for we're going to take a dime less than a million dollars. I, there's probably not a technique going to bridge that gap. So what, and guess what? The mediator charged a lot of money. So well, you have the ability to say, I'll see you. Court. You have the ability to say, I'll see you in court. So you're in a different oh, position than a lot of other attorneys. That's really yeah, cool. I'll see you anyway, in court. I, 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 didn't, I didn't mean to, let's, let's get back on track. Sorry. I didn't mean to. But by just, the way, Morgan, Morgan and Morgan, our firm, we, we try probably more, I'm sure more cases than anyone in America. We are wired to go try cases, not just me trying cases. We try every week. Our emails light up on Friday with all the verdicts coming in. So when when anyone in our law firm says, all right, you know, we tried, we'll see you in court, they know we ain't bluffing. Um, and that's a oh, powerful abs- Absolutely. And you're you're obviously one of the all-stars of this, the biggest firm in the country that does it. So really yeah, honored well, to have okay. you. I'm, we're, all right, we'll see you in court, and, and I'm bringing old man Mitnick, you know, and for whatever it's worth. Sometimes that helps. And we got we got some other folks that are trial specialists that are fantastic and and so they know we're coming. They know we're coming when people know what they're doing. But that's a that's not, that's a different topic. So so anyhow, in a mediation setting, this is something I've done, and I teach our our lawyers to do it because I think it's a very effective way that uses this exact tool. You come into mediation, and and you got, um, let's all right. I'm going to give you a real life example. On the other side, they're not offering enough. But you think there's a realistic chance you might settle the case. I wouldn't waste my time on this. You're so far apart. Don't disclose what you're going to tell the jury and give them a heads up. But you really think there's a chance you're going to settle the case, but you need to move them off their rock a little. One of the techniques I would do is rather than say, well, listen, let me tell you what we're going to do to you. And blah, 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 blah. You're just button You know what the other lawyers say? Well, I'm going to tell you what I'm going to do. And you get nowhere. You go further apart, not further together. So what I will say is, listen, I'm not going to sit up here and tell you all of our good facts and all the things we think are going to make us win. You've got a really good lawyer. You're a very experienced adjuster. You, I know you've gotten reports. I know you know it all. And I'm not going to just sit up here and talk to hear myself talk or sound impressive. But what I do know is there are certain facts that you're relying on that are giving you confidence and it's giving you confidence, and the more confident you are, the less inclined you are to compromise. So I want to talk about some of the things that are giving you confidence, and I'm not going to tell you you're wrong. What I am going to tell you is what I'm going to be telling the jury about those things. Because in fairness, you want to make a smart business decision. And you can't make a smart business decision if you're not fully informed and your lawyer can't inform you what I'm going to tell a jury. I can. And while I'd like to hold it back and not tell you and surprise you with it, as a courtesy and respect for the process and respect for you, I'm going to share for whatever it's worth what I'm going to be telling the jury about this. And then you don't need to respond. But when you go back and start in your own room in private talking about it, I just ask you to consider what do you think that how that may play with the jury. And and I can tell you, because I've said this to many jurors before, it doesn't always is effective, but it usually is. But you decide. But I, I don't want to keep you in the dark. That would not be fair. So I'm going to give it to you if you don't mind. I go, yeah. And then I list, these are the things you're, you're most excited about. And I understand why. And let me tell you, the one, two of them honestly doesn't worry me much because here's what I'm going to tell the jury. But there's one of them that if we lose, it's probably going to be on that. That, to me, is your best fact. And I'm not bullshitting. It, it is. And what does it hurt me? That's a really way? amazing approach to just show the cards, basically. But th- you know what happens? They go from, or they're overdoodling, not listening, and, you know, just I- any way they can to show you disrespect. And then all of a sudden, they're going, well, I want to hear what he's going to say to the damn jury. And he just acknowledged what we were excited about. And he's right. Um, and he's even admitted that's the one, if he loses, is going to be on. What the hell is he going to tell the jury about that? And then I tell him what I'm going to tell the jury about that. Um, he, aren't you that? scared to sh- say why maybe you're wrong or, you know, for lack of a better word, or, you know, where your weakness is? Like, isn't that something that 
is a big no-no and I'm not trying it to patronize. Is. I'm serious. Like that seems no. crazy to, to do that. No. Like you're showing I'll weakness you and you're, you're showing a chink no. in your armor. Let me ask you this. Do you think they don't already feel great about that fact? Yeah, but why would you bring it up? Why would you show weakness? Especially if you feel like you're, you're correct. All right. Let me ask you when I'm done, if it sounds weak. I mean, being honest with somebody, by the way, when is the last time someone told you, look, I'm, I'll acknowledge this is a problem and, and this could be, but, but look, you know what you do when you hear that? You don't think they're weak. You think this crazy son of a bitch is so confident. He's not scared to say the obvious. And there's a, and there's a trust and there's an immediate, now I like you. And there's a, there, and there's a lot, they're like, they're, you know what they're saying is, boy, this is out of the mold. This guy's unusual. And when I'm done with what I'm going to tell the jury, they go away going, I don't know if I want to walk into court with this guy. He's tuned in and he's not a bullshitter. And if he talks to a jury that way, they're going to like him because he's a straight shooter. God damn, he's a straight shooter. And I am. And it's an advantage. I don't be a straight shooter as a strategic tool. I am. But and you've seen and you've seen that literally turn 180s in a mediation alone. Absolutely. That's so, so here's, cool. Let, let me give you the cool. example. So I'll give you a real real life example. You've got um, a bunch of social media posts showing my guy rowing a rowboat. He's in crew after the injury, winning, holding up his trophy carrying the boat over his head with four or five other people. It's a neck injury case and being with his friends, doing all kinds of stuff. Plus a surveillance of him carrying not a 12 pack, but two 12 packs under one arm and from the, a beer, putting it in his trunk, going to the beach and unloading it. And we're talking about, we're going to be asking the jury for over a million dollars. And I know what y'all are thinking. You're thinking he doesn't look hurt bad and the jury is going to be offended because he, that can't be a bad injury. Look at him. He's living an active life. And, and I understand why you feel that way, but if you don't mind, I'm going to tell you what I'm going to say to the jury about it. And you got to be careful not to fall into and, and like you're preaching to them because they're going to shut down. I will look away from them and pretend there's a juror over here. So I don't fall in the trap of wagon because I'm a wagger starting to wag at them. I it's look such over a here. great nuance. Like just, just that alone. That's gold. Like don't, don't be preaching. Don't wag the finger. Pretend like there's a jury. So you're acting it out. So it's depersonal. That's amazing. I want them to be an observer and like they're going to be if we don't settle because that guy's going to sit in the back of the room and watch all this and say, now you're going to see what I'm going to say and you can assess how you think it may play out with the jury. And then I say, listen, this is not, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, this is not the kind of injury that interferes so much with the doing as it does with the experience of doing. It's the kind of injury that, that, that it's, people call it some injuries, Cane pain. This isn't cane pain. You don't need a cane to get around. This is more like pilot light pain. Pilot light pain, for those of us that are old enough, pilot light was in old hot water heaters or stoves, and you would turn it off, but it never went out. It was always there flickering. And when you would turn up the heat, it would blaze. But you'd turn it back off, and it didn't go out. It was always there flickering. That's why it's often called pilot light pain, because it's always there flickering. And my client lives between flickering and flare up and it's taken my client's ability is taken my client's freedom to live life without making a bunch of many choices. Do I do or don't do? They can still do, but they're going to pay a price. Or do you say, I'm not up for it today. I'm not going to do it. Now they've sacrificed what they would have done or they do it and they pay the price they're laying on a heating pad. They're taking pain pills. Now that's this kind of injury. And by the way, folks, this kind of injury that interferes not so much today with the doing as it does with the experience of doing is not a small matter because the experience of doing is very important. As human beings, we treasure pleasure. Life's not all pleasure. Life's hard, but we treasure pleasure. 
That's why the jury instruction the judge is going to give you says, you shall consider as one of the elements of damage the impact on enjoyment of life. That's because enjoyment of life matters in a world that's hard. And this impacts enjoyment. Can he still go to a movie and enjoy the movie? Sure, but it's a different experience than if you're sitting there just taking it in going, <laughs> or, <laughs> or if you're doing the same thing, but there's that fidgeting around trying to get comfortable because it never goes away. It's wearing. It's like walking into a department store and you hear that noise and you can't get ever away from it, ever. It just wears over a little, takes little pieces over a long period of time and it takes a huge toll. But they, they can still go to a religious ceremony and get a lot out of it, but it's a different experience because they're sitting there saying, I can't wait till he's done so I can get up and move. I need to stand rather than just taking it in and tear it up because it's touching you. It's a different. You can still do sports. The person can still go on their job. But you know what? they got to make a decision. All those little choices, their freedom to just jog without worry is gone because they're either going to go slow to minimize the impact or today I'm blowing it out. But they're going to pay the price. And this is not the kind of injury that you can judge from the outside looking in. But it doesn't mean we can't get to the bottom of judging it. Doesn't mean you have to take their word for it. Because we have MRIs, and MRIs don't lie. And you're going to see them with your own eyes. And we're going to have surgeons who are going to come in who met the patient and put all the pieces together and did what we call a clinical correlation and are going to tell you this is a serious injury happened in that crash, period. And the defense is going to show you these Facebook pictures. Let me show you some. I'm going to put them up. Look, folks. They're going to show you this surveillance from picking up all this beer in one arm. Look, I'm going to show you a clip of it. No one has ever, ever said he can't do those things. But you know, the, you see all of his buddies with him. They're all fit and shaped. They're all in their late 20s. You know what nobody else is doing so that they can smile and have fun and do all? They're not all getting now up to 25 injections so they can maintain a quality of life. But you can't see that from the outside. We've all heard the saying, you can't judge a book by its cover. Well, we're going to open the cover up for you, wide open, when we get into this trial. And we're going to show you what's going on the inside. And you're going to know, and you're not going to have to just take a word for it. But you can't judge it from the outside. You know what it's like if you were to judge it from the outside? It'd be like two students were fighting to get the best grade in the class. They're the two smartest kids. And one of them's kind of a little imp. And so that one switches out the test, the written test into Spanish, knowing his competitor doesn't read Spanish. So he gets a bad grade. Well, that wasn't a test of his competency. It was a trick. So we can't look at the pictures from the outside because that's an external assessment doesn't fit this because this isn't cane pain. And you know what most of the external assessments are? Not that big a deal. Some are horrible, but most. If I sprain my ankle and I walk around, I'm limping. I'm on crutches. It's a giveaway. You can tell from the outside. And I roll up my pants and take off the ace bandage. You can oh, put it on. It looks gross. Broken arm. The cast gives it away. It's intense pain for a short period of time. It's short-lived. When the pain is less intense... You can't see it from the outside. But when it lasts forever, those other injuries bail in comparison because they're short-lived. This is forever. But we can judge it and see it the ways I've told you. We're going to prove it to you. You don't have to take their word for it. But let me add the last piece to this, folks. Today's as good as it's going to get. As the natural aging process overlays on top of those damaged links in my client's spine, it's only going to get worse and worse because the spine never gets a moment off. It's always under use and stress. And it's going to get worse and worse and worse. And there's going to come a day where it starts interfering more and more with the doing in addition to the experience of doing. But we don't come back here in 30, 40, 50 years from now and redo this. We get it right now or we don't get it right at all. That's why they say it's a verdict for all time. Now, I'm going to tell that to the jury. 
I turn back to him. And I say, look, you may go, sounds good, get out the violins, I don't care. I said, but now you at least know what I'm going to tell them, and you can assess it from your perspective, might that work or not? And by the way, here's our verdict book we hand out, and I don't want to rub it in your nose, your lawyers know, but you don't have to take my word for it. I can name in there if you want to know. It has the mediator. I'll come in. I'll show you the ones where I made that argument. And you'll see what the verdict was and what the settlement offer was. So honestly, folks, whatever happens, I respect your view and I understand your view and I'd probably feel the same way. But at the end of the day, I don't decide. You don't decide. The jury decides. And now you know what they're going to hear. I love it. I love it. I mean, even your turns of phrases – um, the pilot light pain. This, you can't judge a book by its cover. Let's open the book. You're just dropping bombs on here, and they're really, really beautiful. And your likability is off the charts. Uh, I don't know about mine because I was interrupting you a lot in this one. But no, um, I don't mind. I like. <laughs> no, no, you're you're really you're really you're really a, a, a gem. And this this has been an, this has been amazing. Uh, do you have any other closing thoughts on this topic? Yeah, yeah. Let me just. I'm going to give you one courtroom example with a jury. With a juror, actually a whole jury, because it morphs into what I'd really like to end with, which is the global appeal of this and the global benefit of it to all of us in difficult times. But it came, I was trying a case in a very conservative area. I won't say where, but a very, very, very conservative, very wealthy conservative area. Does it rhyme um, with Schmexus? Sorry. <laughs> no, no, it does not. It was in Florida. Um, but... Um, and they were just notorious for not getting good verdicts down there. And um, we tried a case. And, in the, and it was going really well, really well. And the other lawyer was a nice guy. I liked him. And in closing argument, he did something outrageous. But it scared the shit out of me. It was so bad. It caught, I don't get caught off guard much, but it, I, I couldn't believe he was doing it. And I'd kind of let the moment of Jack go. And if I'd have jumped up when I did, it had gotten even worse. So I just had to self-help it and rebuttal. And I applied this process. And here's what he said. He said, you know, we got TV news. You got MSNBC. You got CNN. And then you got Fox News. I'm a Fox News watcher. Not Everybody on our juror was, he knew, were Fox News watchers. It was just totally inappropriate. But I'm like, <laughs> then he went further. I'm like, it's too late to stop now. I'm going to look like I'm on MSNBC. Wait, why is, why, is it, why is it inappropriate for him to bring up Fox News and appeal to the jury like you, that? You can't bring in politics into the courtroom to try and swing jurors, number one. Number two, who he watches on news, you know, it's like, and it was a blatant play on prejudice and sympathy. That had nothing to do with the facts. It's totally irrelevant. Although I give him credit. He tied it in a little at the end. But he, he tied it in in a way that made it even worse, he says. And, you know, one of the reasons that I really like Fox News is their, their motto is fair and balanced. Fair and balanced. And y'all just heard this is closing argument. I've done mine. I've got a rebuttal. I get to get back up but for a few minutes. But he's on his turn. And I've already asked for a lot of money. It was a seven-figure because it was worth it. It was a valid, that was the only, to ask for less would have been chicken shit and unfair. So I asked for what it was worth. And um, he gets up, Mr. Minnick, talking about all this, you know, more than a million dollars. He goes, and, and I think about Fox News amount of fair and balanced. And, you know, all we ask is that you don't do some way left to center crazy number. You just do fair and balanced. And I thought, God almighty. And I, I, I knew the jurors were, were body language and questions. It felt like the case was going good. And I could feel the, he was just like reminding them, don't give these son of a bitches a bunch of money. You might as well become a Democrat if you do. And, and I'm like, damn it. I hated it. It was wrong, but I give him credit. It was smart. And that guy had laid low and been real nice. And he just waited the last minute to gut punch me. So, I thought, okay, I got to deal with it. And I thought through, you can, you, there's only one way to talk to these folks. It's from their shoes. And what matters to them? And so I kind of, I'm still listening to his final stuff, but I'm processing quick because he was done. That was his final thing. Within two minutes after that, he's done. So I stood back up and said, you know, counsel talked about fair and balanced and Fox News and MSNBC and 
No matter where you stand, I think one thing we all can agree, we've gotten so divided in our country, it is heartbreaking. It is heartbreaking. And we walk around in our society angry, upset, worried, and it's very disheartening and it's very troubling. And people ask me, because you can look at me and tell I've been in a lot of courtrooms. People ask me, why do you spend so much time in courtrooms? And you know what I say to them? Because it's hollowed ground. This is a place where all of that divisive outside is put aside and we can have a moment to come together and do something special. We can do something together that is at the core of America, justice. And I am blessed to be able to be in here so often. It's almost escape, but it's more than an escape. It takes us back to the original values of our country. And gosh knows we all need to be reminded of it. And this is not just a place of a reminder. It's a place of doing what our country was built on. And I'm going to sit down because you're probably tired of hearing me talking, ready to go do justice. And I just ask one thing. Please bring back a verdict that is an all American verdict and does all American justice. That is amazing. I want to be on that jury. Like I, that is that is like a movie moment. You hey, turn what that guy I, did on its head. I literally, I literally had tears coming down. I was afraid they're going to move for mistrial because I was crying and my voice was cracking because I am broken about what's going on out there. And I do feel like this is safe haven for me. It is hollow ground. And they could feel I meant it. And you could see them sitting up tall. And it wasn't a trick. Again, I talk to them in a language we can all understand and we all crave. And they brought back what is to my, I was told, I've never checked it, was the biggest verdict they've had in, the, in that county. Fair so, and balanced, as they fair, should. And it was fair and balanced. There's nothing wrong with the saying it was trying to be exploited in a wrong way. And I just stopped the exploitation. But how did I do it? You know what I did for just a moment? I put aside right and wrong. I stepped into the, their shoes. And I thought, if I'm in their shoes, what would matter to me? And you know the beauty. This is what I want to finish on. The beauty of it to me was. Is probably why I was tearing up. Because I realized what matters to them is the exact thing mattered to me. We all want the same thing. And I just think, what in the world is going to bring our divisiveness together as a country? It's a lot easier to do in a courtroom with six people than across the nation. And I'm not silly enough to think I got an idea that's going to fix it all. But I do believe if people would take to heart this process and say, you know what? The people on the other side of the aisle who I don't agree with, for just a moment, I'm going to try to think how they see. Both ways. Democrat to Republican, Republican to Democrat. And say, I'm going to pause long enough to appreciate and step in their shoes. Because the empathy that comes out of that, if both sides did it, I think there's a chance we can remember we are all American. We all love each other. We don't, we ain't got no business hating one another. So beautiful. That's really, really beautiful. Thank you so much, Keith. Thank you all.